London news agents. Talk about uh, support gathering around your cabinet colleague Penny Morden, that she could be a candidate that people will unify around and that the Prime Minister's days are number. How, how safe do you think he is? Uh, well, I'm sure if Penny was here, she would be uh, distancing herself from those comments. I've been saying for a long time that the small minority of MPs who think that this is something to be talking about should stop it. We have local elections. People need to know what the government and local government has been doing for them. I don't think that there is very much to these rumours. It's almost the same thing we've been re reading week after week for the last two years. And we need to make sure that one or two MPs cannot dominate the news narrative when 350 uh, plus MPs have different views. That is Kemi on Penny. Uh, Penny Mordant, who apparently is on manoeuvres and may be thinking about trying to unseat Rishi Sunak. It has been an awful week for the Conservative Party, both in terms of handling, but also in terms of poll numbers. One poll at the weekend had them down to 18%. It's pretty perilous out there. And it would be unnatural, it being the Conservative Party, if people weren't plotting. It is almost unthinkable that the Conservative Party could crown their fourth Prime Minister without actually going to the polls. But what seemed unthinkable just weeks, months ago, now doesn't. And the bigger question is, if we're not seeing an election early May, can Rishi really hang on to the end of the year? Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And this is, we are told by Rishi Sunak, the week for bouncing back. Now put everything you know about Alan Partridge's autobiography out of your head <laughs> and treat this with the respect it deserves. Because Rishi Sunak has said something to start the week off, which I think is going to get under the skin of a lot of his colleagues. And that is a warning shot. If you think... You can replace me, displace me, get rid of me. I can just pull the plug and call an election. Now, we don't know how solid the numbers are for even talk of replacing Rishi Sunak. But we do know, I think, that the moment you start saying to your colleagues, I'm going to use an election to shut you up, that's going to really annoy a lot of people who might not have been thinking about it in the first place. And it also shows weakness, doesn't it? Because if you're in a strong position, you don't threaten your party with, I'm going to blow us all up together. If you come after me, we're all going down. I will set off. I have got the, the bomb the belt. Bomb, isn't I've it? got the suicide belt and I'm going to take us all down. Yeah. So don't think you can just take me down alone. And I think that is the sort of perilous position that Sunak is in, where another week, another two weeks have gone by, where you've just thought, oh, my God, the judgment is so hapless and they're getting things so wrong and things that are sort of self-evident that what you need to do. And it was telling that it was Kemi Badenoch doing the rounds this morning because it was Kemi Badenoch last week who forced Number 10's hand to change their stance on Hester and say, yeah, of course it was racist what he said. And I think last week Rishi Sunak, decided or thought he was putting the lid on all talk of an early election by saying no May the 2nd. That might have worked for a bit and, you know, maybe the sort of relief in, in the campaign offices and the advertising offices and the newsrooms even, that they don't have to get everything ready in a month's time. But there's also a sense of, well, if it's not going to happen on May the 2nd, which was the one that would align with local elections anyway, then what does the rest of this year look like? And if the local elections are bloody, and to be fair, the Tories did incredibly well the last time this set of elections were fought, because it was Boris Johnson really at his kind of the height of his electoral campaigning powers. They are expecting things to be pretty awful this time round. If they are, then is there a push? Does that come just afterwards? Do they wait? Do they rely on what Rishi's saying about the economy turning around and Rwanda flights starting to get things done? Or do they start trying to surface a few names, put a few names into the list, into the ether, to see how they sound to more people about a different leader? There is an element, and you said it in the introduction, could you change the leader again without consulting the British people so that we get a fourth prime minister. And I think that that is slightly inconceivable. But you do start to think that the Conservative Party are treating 
the leadership and the prime ministership as like fantasy football. Oh, my striker hasn't scored this week and there were no assists. So I'm going to just change my fantasy football team up again. And I'm going to bring in the striker from Aston Villa and the winger from, you know, wherever else, from Wolverhampton Wanderers, because that might get me more points on my fantasy football league. And you just can't do politics in that way. And yet you feel that in the Conservative Party, there is a almost a decadence, a frivolity at the idea that the British people will just stand by and say, oh, yeah, fine, fine, fine. You have another leadership election. You ha- anoint somebody else to be prime minister. Don't worry, we'll sit this one out again. But these fancy footballers also have their own constituencies. And I think that's where it gets interesting. If you look at the kind of names that are, to use your analogy, coming off the bench, maybe, you know, being put in prime position, we're hearing about Kemi Badnock, we're hearing about Penny Mordaunt. Both women, of course, would deny their leadership ambitions. Kemi Badnock shut down not just her own, but she thinks Penny Mordaunt's as well. Penny Mordaunt has not said anything because she doesn't want to fuel fire or flames when she doesn't think there's anything in that. So I guess there are two questions here. Is Penny Mordaunt's name being put out by people who are trying to create mischief, who want it to look like she's on manoeuvres, even, I don't know, by those close to Rishi Sunak, who want people to rally to Rishi because they think that this is a threat? Or is there something in this? Because individually they could want the same thing. I don't think they do. If you look at Penny Mordaunt's seat, Portsmouth North, very likely, according to electoral calculus, to go Labour at the next election. So, in a sense, there is every reason for Penny Morden to think, what's a roll of the dice worth? I might as well try to be Prime Minister if I know I'm going to lose my seat anyway at the next election. Kemi Badnock is looking safer in Saffron Walden. She'll probably hold on to her seat. So why would she want to go early and become PM for, you know, a matter of weeks or months if she could actually win the seat and lead the Conservatives to the next general election as a proper kind of deeper rooted opposition leader and I think that's why you won't see her putting her name into the ring at the moment. A lot will still come down to their electoral chances whenever that election does happen. I suppose there are a lot of Conservative MPs for whom fight or flight is is a real option because if they if they just accept their fate we're going down in flames there's nothing we can do about it and we're just stuck with Rishi Sunak then it's a fatalistic outlook but if you think The only chance left of us winning is to get a new leader in because Rishi, decent guy, but politically not astute enough. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you do give it that crazy roll of the dice. I just think that the British people will take such a dim view of being shut out of the process again and it being 130,000 members of the Conservative Party who are the only ones allowed to vote on it. Well, let's bring in somebody who's just been listening um, to us talk this through. It's Geoffrey Clifton Brown. He's the Conservative MP for the Cotswolds, and he's also the Treasurer of the 1922 Committee. And I'm imagining, Geoffrey, as you were listening to us, you were saying, oh, stop fanning the flames. There is nothing to see here. We're not going to change leader, and Rishi's doing just fine. But prove me wrong. Well, I think there is a small element of people doing exactly what you're saying, Uh, Clearly, historically, we won a very big victory in 2019. So you would expect, whatever the outcome of the next election, we will be a smaller party. Even if we actually win the election and get into government, we will be in a smaller party than we are at present. That means that there are MPs out there that are doing exactly what you say, rolling the dice and thinking, how could I possibly save my uh, career and my seat? There are others, I think, positioning themselves for a post-electoral position um, and thinking, what can I do now to ensure that my particularly preferred candidate is actually going to be there in the event that there is a change of leadership? So Penny Morden, Kemi Badenoch, among others. Well, I wouldn't even necessarily say it's them themselves. It's their particular supporters. Yes, I mean, you've named two people who will clearly be in the frame for a future leadership campaign. Others will be... uh, Robert Janrick and, and, and Suella Braverman, they're all going to be in the frame. And that's why I think it's so divisive and so damaging to have a leadership campaign now. It's not as if there's a Margaret Thatcher out there who the whole party can unite around and who would make a significant difference. I think you're absolutely right that if we have a leadership uh, campaign now, the, par- the, pu- the public the world will think the Conservative Party has gone mad. Four candidates in four years, four prime ministers in four years. 
They simply will think that we're taking leave of our senses Je- and we will do even worse in the polls. Geoffrey, I guess they're I- only in a position uh, to take on a, a leadership role post-election if they haven't lost their seats. Now, I know the polls uh, can tell us very different things, but at the moment it looks like a lot of those people that you're thinking about, that you're talking about, that we're all hearing about, won't even be MPs after the next election. So what's to stop them from saying, if I want to have a crack at it, I might as well try now? Well, I get that argument, but I just simply go back to to saying to you that if we have another leadership change now, I think the public will think we've gone completely bonkers. We've seen it historically, haven't we? United parties win elections, divided parties never win elections. So, you know, we are best to unite around Rishi Sunak. He may not be the most exciting person, but he's actually getting on, governing for the party, making the right decisions, and actually doing some really good things for the country. And I think that will become clearer as we get towards the general election. And it will also become clearer that the alternative of the Labour Party, with no plan, will simply not be the better party to govern this country for the next five years. Geoffrey, I think I'm right in saying that you went and saw Rishi Sunak uh, last week as part of a kind of delegation from the 22 committee to meet with him. Did you say you need to do better? Well, I can't obviously comment on what it was essentially a private conversation. I can give you my personal view as to what the situation is, if that would be helpful. Very. My personal view is that we should actually be communicating those successes that I've been alluding to far better. Uh, the budget uh, had some important announcements in it, but we lost the communications battle after two days. We should have been having that on the front pages for at least a week. And I have suggested that we take a theme, we run with it, we get the whole cabinet behind that theme and try and communicate uh, these successes uh, properly. But whose fault is that? Because whenever I've heard, and I've heard this for years when a government's doing badly, you say there's nothing wrong with the policy, it's just our communication. Where does responsibility lie for that? Because presumably, look, Rishi Sunak is the CEO. He should be driving what the messaging is. Well, I accept that entirely. Of course he's got to dominate the policy. But what we're doing at the moment is just simply reacting to events. Uh, Take the donor scandal. We should have admitted straight away that what he was potentially said, allegedly said, I don't know whether it was or whether it wasn't, was racist and dealt with it in that way and moved on, instead of which we allowed the the whole thing to dominate the news for a couple of days when we could have actually allowed allowed some of our achievements to be dominating the news for the next couple of days. So I think there is, I agree with you, he is the chief executive. He's got to be in charge of the number 10 operation. He's got to be in charge of the CCHQ operation. But I think the communications need to be sharpened. So, of course, once you've admitted it's racist the question is why would you want your party to be funded by a racist or by somebody who uses racist language should that money have gone straight back then i don't know the facts of this but i'm told that this was something that was said in a private meeting five years ago why would somebody have stored that up and announced it now, I suggest to do the maximum damage to the party. If it, if they felt so strongly about it, why didn't they bring it to everybody's attention five years ago? So would that be your way of saying, we, you know, publish and be damned, we're keeping the money and we'll keep any extra money that comes from that same person? Well, I think these are matters for the party. They're not matters for me as a, a, a normal backbencher. No, but as you're I also understand- a treasurer of the 1922 committee. So presumably you think about the way the party and its various elements are funded. Well, of course I do. Um, uh, and the answer to that is, uh, as Mark Harper said on the Coonsberg programme yesterday, this donation uh, uh, has been properly declared, properly recorded, and it's in the public domain. As as regard to future donations, I don't know whether there will be any future donations or not. But how do you uh, feel about that, Jeffrey? I'm just I'm just trying to get the sense really of of what it, you know. Here you are. You want to move on to other things. You want to talk about the economy. The clearer the answers are, I guess, the more people shut up and move on. I mean, how do you feel being in a party that is or has accepted that money and doesn't say we would never do that again? Well, we clearly would not accept uh, any future donations from this uh, this particular donor, having said what he said, which I think was totally wrong. It was it was unkind. It was racist. Uh, if it if it is as it was alleged in the in the media, it came out as it was. 
we shouldn't, we won't, I'm sure, uh, 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 accept any future donations. What happened five years ago is five years ago, it's before the last general election. And we want to be as clean as we can about these donations. There have been other instances in other parties where similar things have happened, uh, and they've not accepted the donation. And that's how it should be in politics. There, that's why we have the system of public de de declaring the donation so that people can make a judgment when it was said and how it was said. And this is, as I say, five years ago before the last general election. We know that the Conservative Party has declared £10 million in donations from Frank Hester. You're saying that should be it. And if there is another £5 million in the offing, that should go back. Absolutely. I would say that. That's my own personal view. Um, but that's, an, that's entirely a matter for the Prime Minister and the party. I think this having come out, uh, it would be wrong for the party to accept any future donations. Geoffrey, did you breathe a sigh of relief when the Prime Minister said there's going to be no election on May the 2nd? Absolutely, because I think we need the extra five or six months to some of these good achievements. Uh, for example, the economy, lowering, lowering of inflation, uh, real wages going up, interest rates hopefully coming down. These things need to be felt by the British people so that they can then make up their mind who is the best party to govern and who is the best prime minister to govern this country in the next five years. And I know you've said what outcome you prefer, which is that Rishi Sunak leads you into the next election. What are the chances, do you think? What are the odds that he will? I think extremely good. I say I reckon that there is a fairly small number of people promoting the sort of things that you in the media want to hear about splits in the party. I do not detect that there is any wholesale wish to get rid of Rishi Sunak at this stage. Mr. Jeffrey Clifton Bound, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. A lot, I guess, stands on what wholesale means, which goes back to the conversation that I was having with pretty senior Conservatives last week, which is if it's, you know, 10 or 12 voices, the usual suspects agitating, then they don't take it seriously. If it's 100 and 150, then they do. But actually to replace Rishi Sunak, all they need is 15 percent. 15% right? to force a leadership contest. To force a leadership contest, which isn't actually that many. No, it's not that many. And I suppose what would be the worst possible outcome is that there is a leadership for the Conservative Party, I'm talking just in those terms, is you have a leadership contest. It, it reaches the requisite number of MPs to force the contest. You have the contest and you don't get enough votes to get rid of Rishi Sunak. And he's left there, kind of lame duck, limping to an election, leading the party into this election, when it's clear mm -hmm. he does not have a united party behind him. And that would be the worst of all worlds, even worse than the 18% polling situation that they're in at the moment. I think it's so interesting because it feels like there is a disconnect. When you listen to somebody like, you know, Jeffrey Clifton Brown speaking about we, we might not end up with as many MPs as we did in 2019, they had an 80 seat majority. I mean, we are not, according to the polls, talking about anything like that this time round. As you say, if they're literally sitting on around 20% of the vote, that is a wipeout. Most of them are not going to hold on to their seats. And so now you're kind of in this very new territory, which is, are they actually trying to win the election? Do they think still? Is there a disconnect with people like Jeffrey who think, yeah, we can still win it, we can still win it? Or are they just thinking individually about who gets to hold on? You know, do they just try and, and sort of plug a few holes in the boat to see if the people that hold on could then lead the party because I think that's a very very different message and it makes people act in a very different way suddenly you're not thinking about being a united party that wins you're just thinking about whether you might have another job for five years I also thought it was very telling he said <laughs> that he said there's no Margaret Thatcher on the back benches I mean you know Margaret Thatcher had been a cabinet minister who'd been the education secretary before she succeeded Heath. I mean, he was saying essentially there is no talent on the back benches. So why would we think that there is anyone there? You know, I guess there's... he was. I No, I think he was saying there is no sort of illuminating one standard bearer for the Conservative Party right now. Yes. Right. And I think that anyone who emerges will divide the party. That's kind of effect of Brexit and all the divisions that have taken place over all the years, the expulsion of so many Conservative MPs by Boris Johnson and the like, that there is a, a party now that is sort of just about hanging together as a coalition and everyone positioning themselves for the post-election bloodbath that is likely to take place. 
And we'll be back in a second with Ofcom, GB News and the monarchy. GB News is in trouble, part seven. Ofcom has once again ruled that it was in breach of broadcast guidelines with two shows presented by Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, the well-known television presenter, and three episodes of a show presented by Esther McVeigh, the common sense minister, and her husband, Philip Davis. Uh, GB News is deeply concerned about the chilling decision. But what is Ofcom going to do about it? Well, we got some kind of clue on Twitter from Exploding Heads. Well, then the next time it happens, we'll be clear cut and unambiguous by doing something about it internally. And then the time after that, we're going to take drastic action. So not the next time it happens, but the time after. Unequivocally, yeah. And, and they won't be getting away with it. Our message is crystal clear. In two or maybe three times time, you will be sorry. And so what will you do in two or three times time? We'll write an unequivocal tweet saying, stop mm. doing this. Mm. And then if it happens again, I'm sorry, but we'll have absolutely no choice but to write another tweet. And what will the tweet say in two or three times time? It'll say very robustly, enough is enough. Thank and you, enough's enough. In so there you go. That was not, just to clarify, Ofcom. That was a sense of how little people assume Ofcom will ever do about GB News, even though they keep coming out with these statements. Reading from the official Ofcom statement today, they say a series of investigations concluded that five programmes on GB News featuring politicians acting as news presenters broke broadcasting due impartiality rules. And partly that is because, as you said, a politician cannot be a newsreader, news interviewer or news reporter unless exceptionally there is editorial justification. A lot is hanging in that because we don't know what is exceptional and what is editorial justification. And we do know that the whole premise of GB News, it is predicated on having people who are not just inside the Conservative Party, but sitting MPs, former cabinet ministers, literally hosting their programmes. So either Ofcom does have a problem with that or else... It doesn't, because every time a sitting politician is hosting a programme, they are going to be a newsreader or a news interviewer. So what is Ofcom going to do about this? Well, use language like robust and unequivocal, but do nothing. And does that eventually, what, spell the end for GB News? Or does it start to spell the end for Ofcom if they're seen to have no teeth whatsoever, and everyone is actually turning them into satirical skets. Or does it mean that you get the BBC and ITV appointing current ministers to be on their shows as presenters? I can't see that for a second. And also, I think there would be the most unbelievable hue and cry if either BBC or ITV or Sky was employing a serving government minister or who was somehow part of the government to be a presenter on any of their shows. And it just kind of bewilders me slightly how it is that GB News is kind of able to foxify British television. In America, there isn't an Ofcom that regulates any of this. It all stopped in Ronald Reagan's time. So why is it happening here when the, the, when the broadcasting ecosystem is meant to be entirely different to the US? The conclusion that we are sort of um, banana stepping towards, but nervous of, is that Ofcom is scared of GB News because the whole shtick of GB News is that they don't like censorship, they don't like the mainstream media, they want to do things differently, they don't want to be, their words, chilled by the idea of a regulator. And as a result of that, perhaps, Ofcom is sort of giving them a wider berth to be different. I mean, this is just to carry on with Ofcom's statement. In line with the right to freedom of expression, broadcasters have editorial freedom to offer audiences a wide range of programme formats, including using politicians to present current affairs on other non-news programmes. Politicians may also appear in broadcast news content as an interviewee or any other type of guest, which obviously we know. So I go back to my original point. They know that that's what GB News is doing. So either they don't mind or else they're scared of saying it because at the moment they're trying to throw out a few little pieces of red meat to keep everyone else happy 
and do nothing. Hang on, just hold on, hold on, hold on. They say non-news programmes. What is the name of the channel? Mm. Oh, it's GB News. Yeah. It is not like Michael Portillo getting on some trains and travelling around the world. I mean, if it was Jacob Rees-Mogg on his favourite bus routes around the Cotswolds There'd and Somerset, so many to choose from, there, there would be so many to choose from. Yeah. You know, Jacob what, Rees- what, what's your favourite number? Yeah, exactly, yeah. the 17. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg takes the bus. That would be fine. I'd have no problem with it. But it's Jacob Rees-Mogg doing politics. Jacob Rees-Mogg would have a problem with that. I think, yeah, I think Jacob Rees-Mogg would have a problem with that. But that is the difference. The other thing I think that concerns me about what is happening is that this is great marketing for GB News. It makes them look swashbuckling. It's making the case for them that they are different, that they're not just Sky News or BBC or ITV. They are something completely different that is pushing the envelope, that if you want to get some views that are more right wing than you're going to hear on any other station, come to us. That's their brand. And having Jacob Rees-Mogg and Esther McVeigh and whoever else and Lee Anderson as part of your kind of roster is fabulous. But is it right given the rest of broadcasting seems to be playing by entirely different rules. I suppose the other thing is, if you think of all the other stuff that has gone under the radar, the anti-vax stuff, oh. the conspiracy theories stuff, I mean, at what point does GB News say, this isn't about having a serving politician completely clouding their role between politics and propaganda. It's also about a massive, massive misinformation, disinformation breach as well. Emily, it goes back to a point you made in the McTaggart lecture ages ago, where, you know, you can say an awful lot of people believe that Donald Trump won the election. An awful lot of people believe that Donald Trump lost the election. Only time will tell. That is not our job. They are saying an awful lot of people believe that vaccinations were deeply dangerous and a plot to alter our DNA. Well, that's fine. A lot of people believe that. But is it true? And you're giving vent to opinions which aren't counted at all. It's given free reign by some presenters to expand on their conspiracy theories. And that is not a good place for a news channel to be. Or for an Ofcom regulator to be, quite frankly, in not seeming to mind if they do. It feels like we're getting to fever pitch with the whole royal saga. If you look at social media, then the top three trending topics are Kate Middleton, King Charles, Royal Family, Buckingham Palace. And big royal announcement. And big royal announcement. We are going to put our new selves on the line. Are we not? And say, we don't think there is a big royal announcement. We could be really wrong about this. But the Russian media is going with a mega scoop that King Charles has died and they've actually put out their own royal announcement that says the following announcement is made by Royal Communication. The king passed away unexpected yesterday afternoon. That's Russian media trying to fuel yet more confusion into what we do or don't know about our royal family. That makes me not want to trust entirely the scale of Vladimir Putin's victory. Really if that's what they're putting out. Yeah, I mean, it's how, almost like who they do are, you trust nowadays? I mean, God, if you can't trust the Russian Lord media, Russia, exactly. who can you? Yeah, who can you trust? But it has got to this point now where... You know, apparently Kate Middleton went to some farm shop yesterday and everyone's going bonkers about it and saying this increases the pressure, ratchets up the pressure on the palace to come clean about this or that. I think she went to a farm shop. I mean, I think we've, everyone's got to learn to breathe maybe a little bit over all of this. What does it mean? What does it mean? Going what does it all add shop? up to? Yeah. I mean, it, and it has got to the point of lunacy and this big royal announcement. That, I mean, look, you know, as you say, Maitlis, we could be looking like absolute Charlies and clowns tomorrow if after we leave this studio there is a big royal announcement. But it just seems to be coming from nowhere and it's self-generating. And then... Buckingham Palace is under pressure to make a statement because there's been this whirl of nonsense around. Well, maybe the whirl of nonsense is just a whirl of nonsense and the palace is absolutely right to say, what on earth are you getting hot under the collar about? Yeah. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 